最前沿的科学研究。Welcome to Science Rehash. I'm Shen, and I'm Mehdi. Welcome to this episode. So today we have two guests joining us: Dr. Michael Levin. He's the director for Allen Discovery Center and the director for Tufts Center for Regenerative and Developmental Biology at Tufts University. He uses a variety of techniques, including molecular genetics and biophysics, to address large-scale control of growth and form. His group works with a variety of organisms, from frogs to flatworms to human tissues in culture. Our second guest is Dr. Josh Bungard. He runs the Morphology, Evolution, and Cognitive Laboratory at University of Vermont. Josh also is the co-author of the popular science book entitled "How the Body Shapes the Way We Think." A new view of intelligence. Josh has been working in the field of evolutionary robotics for a long time. What does the evolutionary robotics means, and what is the overall goals? Those are a few questions that we're gonna discuss with Josh and Mike today in our episode. There are a lot of amazing works in the robotics field these days, like the Big Dog of Boston Dynamics and drones and other sophisticated robots. So Shen, we are going to talk about the first living robots made from cells. Could you please walk us through this discovery? Absolutely, I'm really excited about this. So this is a really great example of how two experts from various different fields will come together and create something amazing. Dr. Bongard and Dr. Levin's team. Really leveraged artificial intelligence to construct these bio robots that can assume particular conformations for particular tasks. And what they've done is use a evolutionary algorithm and run it through a supercomputer in Vermont, and designed particular bio robots and conformations specific for a set of structures and behaviors and tasks. Then, after these conformations are produced, Dr. Levin's team at Tufts will take cells from the embryo of African frogs and shape them into those configurations. And what's great about this method is that it's the first time that the robots are completely constructed with cells. There's no artificial additions or any other additional materials in these robots, so they're essentially another form of a living organism, another species, if you will. Many of these tasks in the future that these robots can perform can include navigating through the vascular system to clean up plaques. They can also remove waste from the environment and potentially also improve targeted medicines. My name is、uh, Michael Levin, and I'm a professor of biology at Tufts University. I'm also the director of the Allen Discovery Center at Tufts and an associate faculty at the Wyss Institute at Harvard. I'm、uh, Josh Bongard. I'm a professor of computer science here at the University of Vermont. Please tell us a little bit about、uh, these exciting xenobots and talk us through the, the process from your side, the biology and also the computational biology. The big question that my lab is interested in understanding is how living systems, for example, cells, cooperate and communicate with each other to pursue large-scale goals. So, for example. How individual cells get together and decide to build a particular structure, like a limb or an entire embryo, and then for some systems like salamanders, which can regenerate lots of complex body parts, how they can regrow these things after damage and then know when to stop. So this is very much a question of decision making among cell collectives, and we're interested in understanding how we can understand where shape and pattern control come from, and then how we can learn to modify what cells build for applications in, let's say, regenerative medicine, tumor reprogramming, birth defects, and and things like this. And for us, making these kinds of synthetic living machines are a sort of sandbox laboratory in which. To test our ideas of of how cell information and decision making can be controlled, we had decided a long time ago that we needed some sort of system in which we can watch multicellularity take place from the ground up to give cells the opportunity to get together and decide what they're going to build. And Josh Bongard and I have talked for a long time about the implications of this for computer science and and using. The tools of computer science to help understand this, and then hopefully to also feed back 
what we've learned into the design of, of better robotics. But we were interested in figuring out uh, some platform where this could be done. One such platform, these Xenobots. So they're called Xenobots because they are made of cells from the frog, Xenopus lavis. And this frog is something that we use in the lab as a model system to understand embryogenesis, cancer, and regeneration. And if you take these particular cells out of the context of a frog embryo and you put them in a new environment, what would they actually be able to do without editing the frog genome? And then the second question, can we be predictive about what they're going to build and then can we modify what it is that they make such that it has very particular functions? And so from our end, it was a matter of being able to create these things out of uh, cells that were uh, taken from a frog. My research group here at Vermont, we've been interested for many years about coming to all of this from a robotics and an AI point of view. The basic idea in my group is to take inspiration from biology and recognize that the current deep learning revolution is resting on incorporating synaptic plasticity into machines, and in this case, into neural networks. But of course, synaptic plasticity is just one of thousands of different adaptive mechanisms that are going on in organisms that support adaptive and intelligent behavior. We try and ask, what are we missing? What elements in biology could be incorporated into the machines and algorithms we're developing to make them more intelligent? And I got interested in not synaptic plasticity, but morphological plasticity. How do organisms exploit their bodies and changes in their body to support adaptive behavior? And that's what brought me to Mike's work. And then more recently, our, our work on Xenobot is how do we go about exploiting the morphological plasticity that's possible? And could we develop on our end an AI algorithm that is able to design and push these developing embryos in different directions? What can we get? an AI system to actually design? How can it exploit morphological plasticity in organisms? And in this case, we ended up with a xenobot, which is somewhere between a robot and an organism. So I'm very interested in how you guys started talking about this collaboration. Can you tell us a little bit more about the interaction you had? So I had first come across Josh's work in around 2006, which was this amazing paper on these robots that didn't start out knowing what their structure was, but they learned models of their own structure by observing their own behavior and making inferences. And I thought this was extremely important work and had a lot to teach biology where we have been discovering all this plasticity where basically embryos and other types of bodies are not hardwired but actually have a tremendous ability to adapt to novel circumstances and to work despite great alterations in structure. And I reached out to Josh and we had talked back and forth and ever since then we've been talking about what we should do together. This was a perfect opportunity because as soon as we saw these frog cells and got some, some preliminary data, it was very natural to talk with Josh about trying to provide a computational background to understanding these things. I started to learn much more about Mike's work, the observation that organisms are able to perform very intelligent behavior without brains. As roboticists, there's a lot of emphasis in our field on creating very sophisticated neural network controllers. We refer to this as neural chauvinism, that the, the way to make intelligent machines is to put more and more brains into them. But of course, that's not what's going on in nature. So the things that Mike is learning in his group about how organisms get along without brains is a very different way of coming at the problem of generating intelligent behavior. That's really what drew me into Mike's orbit and, and this collaboration. So one simple question, where did you get this idea of forming a living robot? There are two sides to this. On the one hand, I really think that these particular robots do have important applications that are currently not addressed by any sort of robotic technology. For example, micro-sculpting biological tissues, whether in the body or in the dish. They maybe can hunt down cancer cells, things like this. But, but I think much more important in the long run is going to be what these things are telling us about how normal bodies get together and repair themselves. All problems of biomedicine, possibly with the exception of infectious disease, boil down to one thing, the ability to control three-dimensional anatomy. If we could control what it is that cells build, we could solve birth defects, regenerative repair, tumor reprogramming, aging, degenerative disease, once you understand how to convince cells to build one thing rather than another thing. And this is a very profound question that is largely still unaddressed despite the amazing advances of genetics and stem cell biology. 
These robots are useful because of what they're telling us about the plasticity of cells and how it is that we get cells to build particular functional structures that we can take advantage of. From a robotics point of view, there's there's two interesting avenues here. There is the engineering applications. What, what are the specific advantages of biological tissue? The obvious one, which we've mentioned before, is the fact that these machines are 100% biodegradable and biocompatible. The other advantage it has strengths that complement the strengths of traditional materials like metals and plastics and electronics. So some colleagues who also work in this growing area of living machines are building uh, biohybrids, robots that are made up of artificial and biological materials and trying to combine them in ways so that they complement one another. And there's also the, the scientific aspect of this work. I'm sort of interested in the evolution of intelligence, trying to evolve intelligence in machines, regardless of the material we use. And by asking the supercomputer to design intelligent machines for us, we can watch the process of evolution unfold from simple parts all over again. Although we might not be able to rewind the tape on Earth, we can watch in a simplified environment evolution occurring again, where now the supercomputer is simulating the evolutionary process. We can see you know, what kinds of strategies this process rediscovers that Mother Nature already knows about. Are there novel body plans and strategies, behaviors that our simulated evolutionary process finds? So you start with an intended purposes and let the supercomputer perform a lot of trials and error to come up with different configurations or designs. Correct. So what, what you just described is an, is an algorithm that's usually known as evolutionary algorithms. And they've been around since arguably the very beginning of computers. And so it's, it's a very old idea, trial and error, where you're throwing in random mutations. And instead of the human coming up with the solution, you're really tasking the computer with designing a solution to your problem. In this case, the solution is a xenobot, and the problem is walk along the bottom of the Petri dish. So when it comes to designing a xenobot, what are some of the obstacles you faced? One thing that makes this technology different from prior efforts, and there have been a couple of efforts from, from MIT and Harvard, 3D printing various things and seeding cells on top of them. I think one of the primary uh, things that are important here is that the creation of these xenobots is largely emergent. Uh, what we do at the end, it's a little bit of sculpting. There are numerous challenges. Right now, one is simply getting the material, and it takes a lot of time and effort to get these cells out of the frog embryos and collect enough of them that we can make uh, xenobots of the appropriate size. And down the line, the real challenge is going to be to combine our knowledge of the biology and computer side of things to learn to program these things, to convince them to build something with a different structure. Why cells from African frog, not cells from rats, mice, typical animals that have been used in labs for decades? All of that is coming. We will absolutely be working with mammalian cells, including human cells, which ultimately for patients, that's what you're going to want. Frogs have been used for laboratory experiments since at least the 60s and probably well before that. They are a very common model and some of the advantages that they have Frog embryos develop at room temperature, and so from the very moment of fertilization, you can see every step, and the cells are very good for manipulation. So the frog is a very good uh, starting place, but actually we are already considering lots of other cell types, and we'll be doing that shortly. We just talked about this evolutionary algorithm, and the evolutionary algorithm is running on a supercomputer here at Vermont. What it does is create a virtual model of the Petri dish. And that modeling effort is particularly challenging because we know something about how cells communicate, but not everything. So how do you model the interaction between cells when the computer puts those cells together in novel arrangements? It's hard to predict how they're going to behave. What the supercomputer has to do in this trial and error process is figure out how to build a reliable machine, which is a xenobot that moves along the bottom of the dish, but it's building that reliable machine out of unreliable parts. There's a lot of uncertainty in how those real cells will behave when they're built, but the supercomputer has to be able to predict the function of the novel forms it comes up with. That was a, a very difficult but rewarding part of the computational biology side of it. I want to have you guys explain a little bit of the methodology, the timeline, and how it goes from your lab in Vermont to here at Tufts. Well, the phase zero is the two groups have a conversation. What does Mike's group know about the behavior of these frog cells when they're put together in new ways? 
We take that understanding and build it into our virtual models. We then supply a mathematical equation that we give to the supercomputer that it uses to score the performance of any one virtual Xenobot, how fast it's moving, how well it's doing at carrying a payload, and so on. What are you optimizing for? So uh, in this study, we optimized for four different things, four different tasks, forward locomotion, object transport, collective behavior, sort of very simple sensor motor coordination-like tasks. Once we've asked the supercomputer what we want, it goes to work in designing the Xenobots, and it runs this evolutionary algorithm on about 2,000 cores on the supercomputer here. It would take anywhere from a couple days to about a week. At the end of that process, the supercomputer would give us back not just one design, but in this study, it gave us back 100 different designs, because like biology, Evolution produces not just one solution, but diverse solutions. We then take those 100 designs and we pass them over. And Mike can probably describe this second phase. Yeah, so what Doug will do is uh, take some cells that are uh, going to otherwise become skin and separate them with uh, very tiny forceps and uh, little, little iridectomy scissors, lift this off of uh, the embryo, combines cells from maybe five or six embryos, depending on how big of a xenobot we want to make. And these things are uh, collected together into a little depression uh, made in an agarose slide. And they are left uh, overnight to condense and talk to each other and decide what their plan is. In the next couple of days, we, we take them out and we use this special uh, microsurgery tool that Doug uses to sculpt them based on the designs that came from the Bongard Lab uh, computational efforts. And so, and at that point, they are put in a dish and videotaped for their behavior. We take videos, we make movies of them, and then we analyze those. After that, there's this loop where we go back and forth. And how are you now down the hunt with configurations? On our end, there are a few specific criteria that make our life easier. There are certain things that are very hard to do. So for example, very sharp corners are hard to do. Cells don't like to make sharp corners. So any design that relies on extremely precise sharp corners is probably not a great candidate. We think about what is likely to be doable and also which of the designs are likely to teach us the most about what's actually going on. So it sounds like there's a lot of micro manipulation that is required for changing them into these particular configurations. How reliable is this process, this microsurgery that you've mentioned? Um, the amazing part is that, like most other organisms at these early stages, they are highly regenerative, which means that if you screw up certain aspects of it, the construct tries to help you by doing things like healing, moving together. It, it's a lot of work and it's a lot of very fine micro manipulation, but they also uh, are quite forgiving of certain types of errors because they do have this self-organizing regenerative ability. Is there a way that we could one day program the cells to assemble in a way that we wire them to instead of doing any micro manipulation? I think absolutely. I think the name of this game is to rewire as little as possible and to actually program them by experiences or inputs. The genome does not specify a completely invariant hardwired outcome. What the genome creates are cells that are very good at joining together to form specific large-scale anatomies. And what they make is a function of their environment, their communication with each other, and the signals that they receive. I think this process is, is very amenable to manipulation. And I think this is the way in the future is not programming biology at the level of hardware or, or even of machine code, but actually taking advantage of this amazing programmability of the living hardware. This is an extremely exciting and new idea in robotics and AI, this idea that instead of the AI designing a machine out of dumb parts. So if we're building our machines out of biological tissues, it's the opposite, as Mike said, it's trying to help us. There's this inherent functionality. So it's causing a paradigm shift, at least in my group, to think about machines differently, which is how do we get the AI to find the right initial conditions that will push a developing machine in the right direction? That's something that hasn't really been thought of in robotics and AI before. It's what are the ethical concerns in this process? There are a couple of ethical things that need to be looked at for sure. Anytime you work with living organisms, you have a responsibility to their welfare. And what I will point out is, is just the context of this work. So for a biologist uh, to do any work on any kind of a living system like this, 
we have to write protocols that try to justify what we're about to do. Things that normal people do when they go fishing require for us months of, of protocol approvals and things like this. So there are already lots of uh, mechanisms in place to, to look after the welfare of lab animals. There are also potential safety concerns in terms of what can these things actually do. And the reality is right now, they can neither reproduce nor persist longer than a couple of weeks. So I think this technology, i like, way down on the list of things to worry about. So coming from a robotics uh, background, there is a whole constellation of ethical concerns that people have about robotics and AI, which in many ways are justifiable. Most are unintended consequences. So there are justified ethical concerns just in the field of robotics. And then the moment that you bring in biological mechanisms like we're doing in the xenobots, I understand why some people have you know, fears and concerns about that as well. But again, we are going to continue as a society to build more and more complex machines. It's inevitable. So the most ethical thing I feel that we as scientists can do is understand how consequences arise from simple interactions within complex machines. What are the medical applications of these living robots? Ultimately, what we learned is going to be used for regenerative medicine to build new organs for people in vivo and in vitro, to reprogram tumors and so on. For these xenobots, you could imagine a number of applications. Let's say somebody has an arthritic condition in their knee, a xenobot um, having been programmed like a tiny Zamboni basically to go around the top of the knee joint, they'll crawl along the bone, shave off the correct amount of material, and then degrade. And this would be made of the patient's own cells, and then they basically just disappear after their job is done. That sort of thing, I think, is the kind of early application for the specific living machine. But there, there will be many other applications and then big implications of this will really be felt over the next decade or two as, as this work starts to impact the regeneration of complex organs. From a robotics point of view, there's been work for a long time to try and create very large swarms of very small machines. And that has turned out to be very difficult to do with traditional materials like metals and electronics. So I think the Xenobots is one avenue towards realizing micro robotics you know besides the applications that we mentioned there could be thousands more and it's hard to predict which of those will actually be practical useful can you think of any possible application beyond the medical field and this is just our opinion about potential solutions which is environmental remediation microplastics in the paper how do you go about collecting very large amounts of very small bad things like microplastics or contaminants in soil. It's hard to imagine a technology that will be able to do that well without disturbing the medium itself, which could be these biodegradable, biocompatible xenobots. I love that you call them creatures. If they are artificial life, does that mean that once they're created, there should be different ways to protect this artificial life? Like, do we think about it the same way as we think about a mouse? Yes, absolutely. They are they are absolutely living creatures. I think they have a place on the broad spectrum of life that we find from microorganisms all the way up through through other mammals. Absolutely, they need to be treated with the correct amount of care befitting their capacity to have experiences and to benefit others who may be suffering. We have exactly the same moral responsibility here to balance care for derivatives of amphibian skin versus uh, what it is that we can learn from this that will actually then impact the health of, of human patients and, and others. Can you talk about how you came to Tufts in Vermont? I started with the computer science background as an undergraduate. I came across a master's program which is still running at the University of Sussex. Half the incoming class are computer scientists, half are biologists. The biologists have to take computer programming courses and the computer scientists are thrown into a wet lab, which, as you can imagine, was a very powerful educational experience for myself and others that have come through that program. But it also you know, really imprinted, at least on me, what's possible if you bring together, in this case, a biologist and someone who thinks computationally, if you can appreciate and understand what the other is, what other challenges the other is trying to tackle, Clearly, there are you know, amazing things that have yet to be invented or even thought of that lie at the intersection between computation and, and biology. For me, uh, I started out with a long-time interest in philosophy of mind and 
uh, cognitive science, and I was always interested in how creatures such as ourselves with a centralized unified mind arises from the collection of bits that make up any organism. And originally I was actually an undergrad at Tufts. Uh, I came here to get a computer science degree, wanted to work in artificial intelligence and, and make novel minds basically. And um, I, I was doing a lot of uh, software engineering and programming before that. And when I got here, I finished the computer science major and realized that we didn't really have any of those things that I wanted to do. It was still very poorly understood how any of that worked. And yet every embryo is telling you right there that there's this tremendous ability for certain kinds of systems to behave in a very plastic way that reliably reaches a specific outcome and then actually operates as intelligent cognitive agent. And so it became pretty clear that biology was going to be crucial to this. I got a, I got a second bachelor's degree in, in biology. Uh, I went to grad school, I went to a, a PhD program at Harvard Medical School for genetics. I d did a postdoc and then uh, I, had, I had a lab at a place called Forsyth Institute, which was a Harvard Medical School affiliate for about 10 years. And after that moved to Tufts because it was pretty clear that all of the interdisciplinary things that we were doing required me to be on a basic campus in our medical school where we can work directly with engineers and computer scientists and, and psychologists and so on. So that's, uh, that, that's kind of my history. Mike and Josh, congratulations again on this outstanding body of the work and thank you for being our show and it was a pleasure to talk to you both. Likewise, thank you so much. Thank you. It was a pleasure, thank you both. Thank you for listening to another episode of Science Rehashed. We'd like to thank Dr. Rudy Tanzi for providing us with the music for our intro. You can always find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, or you can visit our website at sciencerehash.com. Also, thank you to our amazing editors, Sufia Nastri and Tavi Pollard. Our show is available through Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or wherever you listen your podcast. Please subscribe and refer our podcast to your friends. We would love to hear your comments and feedback, so please don't hesitate to reach out to us.